I'm Victor Purton and I am the Chief Optimism Officer at the Centre for Optimism. We've got people joining us from Vermont in the US, right through to India. And you know why we're here. You know, we're here to enjoy the optimism and leadership of the young leaders of the Australian water industry. And we've got you know, the Parliamentary Secretary for Water, Harriet, has joined us. And it was just beautiful to get this email back to say she just would love to be here and be a part of it. So we're going to open with Harriet um, sharing what makes her optimistic and optimistic for the water sector. Then we'll be listening to our four leaders, um, Georgina, Chris, Brendan and Donald. Then what we're going to do is a breakout, which is a feature of Zoom that I suspect most of you have used. Harriet, it is just so wonderful to have you here. Thank you so much, Victor. It is a real joy, uh, not just to uh, be part of this event, but to, to actually see so many other human beings, <laughs> let's be honest. Uh, our, our limitations on connection have never been, uh, I think, more pronounced than they are now. So it's, it is really uh, a delight to be here. And I was very um, enthusiastic, puppy-like indeed, in accepting this invitation to be part of a conversation on optimism in water. Um, I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land upon which we variously meet today. For me, that's the Wurundjeri and Boon people of the Kulin Nation. I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past and present and to acknowledge any and all Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander leaders or emerging leaders who have joined us here today. This is of particular importance given the strong and important connection that we have with traditional owners in the area of water as far as uh, the access to an entitlement, the enabling features that water brings, uh, the recognition as part of reconciliation and self-determination that water plays in this particular field. And also uh, the really important work that we as a state are doing in the area of treaty uh, and of the Uruk um, uh, Truth and Justice Commission as well, which for those who aren't aware and who are listening from afar, uh, is part of recognising a, a long and very uh, tragic, in many instances, history um, of our refusal um, or inability to acknowledge um, the ongoing connection that the oldest continuous culture on earth has with the land and the water and the air. So my role in the Victorian Parliament is one which begins in the Upper House, the Legislative Council, and I was elected in 2014. Uh, the first woman, in fact, to represent the Eastern Victoria region. Uh, and uh, it's been a, uh, a significant uh, change, I think, to diversity, not just in leadership, um, also in a way that reflects what's happening more broadly. Uh, and I want to touch on that in a moment with the Women in Water work that has been happening and uh, the commitment which has de been demonstrated by leaders across water in Victoria to bring us not just to um, a 50% a um, representation of women in paid boards, but to sail past that. And now to bring that uh, focus to mid middle and upper management uh, to make sure that we are harnessing the perspectives of women, of, of people from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds, uh, people who would not ordinarily sit on boards, uh, people whose perspectives are so important as we move forward to create and maintain a sustainable resource, to connect better with our communities and to make sure uh, that the agencies, the authorities, land care, the CMAs, um, catchment management authorities and others are working as seamlessly as possible again with that environmental lens uh, and with that lens of really good, effective, consultative uh, governance and also risk management. So I have been the Parliamentary Secretary for uh, Water for about uh, 
it's about nine months now. Before that, I was the parliamentary secretary for mental health, and I've also worked in emergency services. I have the gig in equality and creative industries as well, and so it's a pretty full dance card for me. Uh, it's one of the areas that I absolutely love uh, being part of. It's not only a technical and intricate space to be in as far as the engineering expertise and prowess, but also the planning, the engagement, stakeholder inclusion, and the capacity to have really good, robust, respectful conversations across the board around how we identify challenges and problems, but also how we meet those challenges and problems with really wonderful solutions, which are often lateral, but which are always enhanced by more diversity. So it is a joy to be here. Um, I'm very happy to talk about what the challenges are within Victoria and also uh, I think as importantly, uh, what those solutions look like. But for me, optimism involves inclusion. It involves diversity. It involves a preparedness to respectfully listen and to engage with differing points of view and perspectives. Uh, and it also involves a, an ability to be resilient to understand that setbacks uh, provide opportunities to, uh, to facilitate really good uh, pathways for people to be involved at every level of decision making and to understand that water, um, unlike in many other areas of government, doesn't respect state and federal boundaries. It therefore requires a level of cooperation and consultation uh, in order to get good outcomes and decisions that I think is pretty unique to this particular portfolio and I think uh, reflected as much as anything else by the parallels in climate change and what we do uh, to rise to those challenges. Forcing, I think, a level of cooperation and of, uh, of innovation, which puts us in a really good position to, to engage the best and brightest minds from a range of different fields to come up with solutions and also to role model for others to become part of this sector and this industry. So I can't wait for the panel discussion. I can't wait to hear from young leaders and I can't wait to, uh, to be part of the song around You've Got a Friend because uh, we all need optimism right now. It has been an exceptionally trying, uh, well, many years, in fact, in water, from drought through to floods, uh, from changes and challenges around sustainability. The, uh, the pressures brought about by population growth uh, and with that, the emerging opportunities around technology, uh, around expertise, which can improve efficiency, which can drive access to um, other uh, sources for water to meet potable water demands and a collaboration between uh, stakeholders, all important, uh, including traditional owners, including irrigators, uh, including environmental water holders uh, and overlaid uh, on that, the work that governments can do to facilitate that with a really good faith and best practice approach in mind. So Victor, that's me. Um, <laughs> Um, and, and on a personal note, um, optimism and the things that have kept me optimistic uh, in, in circumstances where I think it, it's very easy to succumb to uh, being, uh, being very crestfallen about where we're at at the moment. The things that matter to me are seeing the seasons change and seeing green um, environments uh, return around us, um, uh, being able to be surrounded in a, a working from home arrangement with animals, um, finding the things that I love and that, that encourage me to be mindful, along with having opportunities like this to meet so many new people, but also to catch up with people uh, from around this sector in particular, who are my role models, my mentors, uh, the people who I respect and have enormous regard for. So this is uh, an absolute delight for me, Victor. Thank you so much for inviting me to be part of today's discussion. And I can't wait to, to see how things unfold. Well, just absolutely brilliant. I mean, one of the first habits of the optimist is to smile and, and to be an infectious optimist. So I think, you know, looking at the smiles of everyone on, on the, the screen, you know, you've just lit up the room, Harriet. It's just, and when we think, you know, the minister was so sick for a while. So those who don't know, because we've got people who've just joined in, for instance, from Dubai, I see that a parliamentary secretary in, in the Australian system is a junior minister. So the minister's been ill for a while. So Harriet, has had the huge burden of running the portfolio and 
you know, COVID in her electorate, et cetera. And yet, you know, there's this smile, there's this infectious optimism. And you've answered my questions. What makes you optimistic? What makes you optimistic for the water sector? But the question I think before we call on the young leaders is what makes you optimistic about the leadership? I've seen it at Yarra Valley, and obviously we've seen it through the lens of the Centre for Optimism, but what makes you particularly optimistic about the contemporary leadership and this emerging leadership we're going to hear from today? That's a really wonderful question, Victor, and I think that it hones in on many of the achievements which the water sector in Victoria has developed. We lead the nation, and I'm not saying anything which is based only in opinion here, on all of the metrics and on the expenditure, on the engagement and on the strategic planning. We lead Australia, the driest continent on earth apart from Antarctica, in the way in which we are developing access to water, improving efficiency, the way in which we are managing the waterways and catchments to be the healthiest that they have ever been, and the way in which we're enhancing efficiency to make sure that our water systems are resilient and secure, and that we have use within known limits. These are part of overall planning and framework um, uh, projects which have been so important. It's like creating a skeleton where the skeleton works well, where the structure is sound and where it's agreed by all stakeholders. We see that the projects which are then built around that uh, create something which works in synergy to not only meet challenges and demands, again, population, climate change, uh, increased pressure through a variety of different stakeholder priorities, but which also uh, are dexterous, are uh, agile and able to meet a range of challenges in a range of situations from urban water security through to uh, the way in which we have good market regulation and oversight, uh, making sure that our rural communities are part of the conversation and sit around the table uh, in managing the changes to the way our demographics move as populations spread outwards, as regional centres uh, move into rural sectors. The way in which we are working to not just build a system sustainable water sector, but also manage flood resilience uh, for the increasingly volatile modelling around El Nino and La Nina and what that looks like for uh, the, the peaks and troughs, albeit against our steady decline uh, in, in, in groundwater um, as, well as, um, as well as rainfall. So I look at our waterways and catchments. I have a great deal to be optimistic about there. And I see all of the volunteer work, all of the work between organisations and agencies coming together in landscapes which speak for themselves. I look at um, examples up in the north of the state uh, where in fact we've seen the return um, of groundwater and of floodplains uh, to areas which were previously parched, the return of landscapes to traditional owners to manage. And with those thousands of years of expertise, I have seen, and I am so grateful for the opportunity to see, the flourishing and the return of flora and fauna, which shows us that while we have made mistakes, while we have uh, scarred and affected our landscape through the wrong decisions in the past, it is possible with collaboration, with commitment, with the right resources uh, and uh, with a momentum that we need to sustain this over multiple governments, over multiple mm -hmm. budget cycles, that these things can be achieved and that the results are nothing short of spectacular. Brilliant. <laughs> and, and that notion of regenerative, we've gone beyond... Uh, I know Gillian, who's, who's in the call, you know, understands this fully, but moving beyond sustainable to regenerative, and I think you've nailed that. The first of our young leaders, Georgie Caddo-Smith, um, is the head of the Australian Water Association's Young Leaders. Um, she's a water engineer with Jacobs. Harriet, do you want to ask Georgina what makes her optimistic? Georgina, thank you so much for, um, for being part of this panel. Um, your very presence is a really wonderful boost in terms of optimism for the sector. Um, as a woman and a woman, uh, I think uh, you look very young. So um, <laughs> I think your youth stands you in exceptionally good stead as well. And it brings 
such a range of perspectives that um, uh, old and tired and exhausted people like me can always learn from. So what is it that makes you optimistic and how, um, how has your journey to optimism evolved as you've been working in this sector? Well, thanks for joining us too, Harriet. And I can say a similar thing about the um, new leaders that are um, exiting university and entering the water industry as well. I think this year I've taken on the chair role as uh, the YWP for the YWP committee. And we had an, a fresh batch of committee members come through at the start of the year. Obviously some trying times, most of us haven't met each other quite a few of them um, are uni students themselves or recent graduates, um, as well as, I, I suppose, partly because of COVID, a lot of people have joined the committee that um, haven't necessarily had experience with the AWA. Uh, so with that becomes, um, I think, a lot of opportunities to bring that diversity of thought, as well as uh, fresh perspectives, fresh enthusiasm, uh, so I can definitely relate to, to that too. Um, I think with that, it was interesting chatting to a lot of the new, um, new committee members that had joined. There did seem to be a sentiment that they didn't necessarily think they matched um, the profile of what a committee member should be uh, based on their experiences. Uh, and I think that um, something I tried to do is definitely instill that the value that they had to bring different perspectives. Uh, so that made me always optimistic to speak to them. Um, I think also events like Oswater this year, we were lucky to host Oswater Conference in May, um, which was incredible. So many different people coming together with different projects, uh, really inspiring stories from across the industry. Uh, and it was a great opportunity to get outside a um, little bubble that we're all living in individually and getting, um, extending that and seeing what's happening around outside the bubble as well. Um, and I'd say also expressing gratitude. That's something I've been making an effort to do personally, um, but also something we do at work. Um, you know, we have a weekly team meeting with um, a team of 80 people and the first couple of minutes are always exchanging moments of gratitude with each other. And uh, that's fantastic. I think it's always not, nice to receive them, nice to give them and nice to hear about um, other people exchanging gratitudes. It's also something we do in AWA meetings. Um, and yeah, great, great way to remember the, the positive things that we do have despite the challenges as well. Yeah, Georgie, you nail it. Her, her gratitude is one of the great underpinnings of optimism. And I know Harriet, you know, in her job as parliamentary secretary, so much of it is expressing gratitude on behalf of the government to people. So it's, it's so important, isn't it, Harriet, is that gratitude and lifting people through gratitude, isn't it? I think that's right, but also identifying uh, in the midst of negativity, that we have so many reasons to celebrate the achievements and the diversity, the commitment uh, and the, um, the dedication that people show to, uh, to being part of solutions. And this is where again, um, Georgina, to pick up on your point earlier, where people say they don't feel like they fit the mold of, of a committee member. That is precisely why they are so valuable. It is precisely why um, there is so much significant input to be had. Um, fresh eyes and fresh perspectives um, often lead to um, the, the ability to see things in a different way, which lends itself toward gratitude as much as anything else. And that's something to be not only um, recognised, but encouraged wherever we possibly can. Yeah, uh, thank you already. Yes, we just say thank you, Harriet. Now we've got Chris Lee joining us and Chris is the head of policy partnerships in the Department of uh, the Environment. And Georgie, do you want to ask Chris what makes him optimistic? Chris, what is it that makes you optimistic? I know you're a very optimistic person. I love hearing your ideas. So please go. Thanks. 
Thanks, Georgie, for that great question. And I just want to start off by acknowledging that I'm coming to everyone today from a Wurundjeri land. And uh, one thing that makes me optimistic is Victoria is embarking on the process of treaty, a very difficult path, but we're starting it regardless. And the progress that's been made by the First Nations Assembly in making those first steps in recognizing Aquinalius and also the steps the Victorian government's taken in embedding cultural values in water legislation. For myself, as uh, Victor has highlighted, I work within the Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning, looking after the economic regulatory framework for the water sector. And one thing that I like to think is um, an optimistic way to think about it is making sure that water bills are fair, stable and affordable for all Victorians. And even in my role as a volunteer in emergency services, while emergencies themselves, they're not necessarily pleasant, they usually come with consequences. What it reminds me of, it is also what makes the community come together and what we can do to make sure it doesn't happen again or we'll make sure we're well prepared if it does. And one thing that I'd like to let everyone know is the future is yet to be written. It's up to us all what we want the future to be and opportunities will always come up to make a difference. And while it might seem hard to make a difference, sometime there will always be a right place, right time. And whenever you listen to inspiring stories, things don't just happen. It's a lot of times it could be just serendipitous chance, but that is what all it takes for something to happen. And the water sector is well placed to innovate. And I know some things that I'm excited for in the water sector is uh, seeing how the circular economy can be embedded mm -hmm. into water, looking at projects that our water corporations are doing, such as Yarra Valley Water exploring um, generating hydrogen from wastewater treatment plants, for example, or even something that seems mundane on the surface, but is actually very um, thought-provoking, which is Southeast Water with its um, Aqua River project and rethinking what does a suburban subdivision look like and how can we make sure our houses are more sustainable with smart water tanks and recycled water, for example. And okay. innovation, it doesn't have to be something brand new and flash. It just has to be a better way of doing things. And a few more things I'd like to share, which I think tie into the COVID situation is a large part of optimism is just making sure that we have the faith that will prevail in the end. And while life is very uncertain, such as right now, there'll always be moments where opportunities come by your door and one thing that someone recently reminded me of was the Stockdale paradox. So while we must be optimistic, we should also confront whatever brutal reality there may be. Mm -hmm. And as surely as COVID will pass, we must remain optimistic. And one quote I really like is, would spring be so sweet if there was no winter? And while I generally don't like haircuts, I can very much say I'm looking forward to one. And for my team, within our government, I like to remind everyone to remain optimistic. We're in a unique position. We have opportunities to influence policy and deliver for all Victorians and making sure no one is left behind. So what I can say is let's be an optimist and make the most of what life throws at us and enjoy the simple things and successes as they come. But it's a masterclass, isn't it, in, in what Chris has said. Those who regularly attend our events know, you know, it's impossible for the pessimist to be an innovator because they're ground down by what went wrong and who went wrong. So that that notion is so important. And then, as you mentioned, the Stockdale paradox, you know, that, you know, we, we've got to be realistic optimists because we know that grief will come along the way, that crisis will come along the way. Uh, Chris, that is just a masterclass. I, I, I'm so profoundly moved by what you've said. And we've now got Brendan Moore who's joined us. And Brendan is the manager of recycled water at Yarra Valley Water, but also the founder of Pride in Water. So he's had a huge role in inclusion, Harriet and the like. So Chris, do you want to throw to Brendan and ask him what makes him optimistic? So Brendan, what makes you feel optimistic? Great question, Chris. And, you know, oh, such a surprise. I wasn't expecting you could ask that today. But um, no, for me, I, I'm a huge extrovert. 
And so I really feed off of the energy that I get from working with people that make things exciting for me and, you know, you know, forming those relationships and, and what that can build for the future and what we can do together. And um, I have really found that connection to people, uh, especially through these harder times, has been key for helping to buoy and keep up my optimism uh, during these uh, during these times. So, uh, as Victor was saying, you know, I think I'm very lucky to work in two very innovative fronts of our industry. You know, my day job is is working in the recycled water space, which is such an exciting untapped potential. I think we can do just so much more in that space. Um, and, you know, that innovation and that optimism about what the future will look like is just so infectious uh, that it, it really just does kind of overspill into everything else that I do. And, you know, as a person, my day job, I've got my gay job as well, uh, as Victor mentioned, which is uh, being the co-founder of Pride and Water. And I think what really makes me optimistic about that is just how positively the conversation around diversity and inclusion um, has expanded beyond what I guess was traditionally thought to be diversity and inclusion. I think, you know, go back 20 years ago, it was about gender balance of females and, and males. Um, we now realize that diversity, surprisingly, is diverse. And, uh, you know, we have the opportunity to focus on things like LGBTIQ plus inclusion with Pride in Water. Uh, we have the amazing Donald here, who hopefully will talk about Water Able as well and what they're doing in that space. And, and the the steps forward that we're making in still in the gender equality space in our cultural diversity space and and in that in our you know our commitment to our indigenous and first nations people as well because water is a ubiquitous resource you know it touches all of us it, it unites us all it's one of the, the few things that regardless of where you are who you are or where you're from or, or what your lived experience is water is a key element in everyone's life and i think the embracing of diversity and inclusion in that space just really fills me with so much hope and optimism for what, uh, what amazing things will come out of that um, uh, promotion of diversity of thought and experience uh, in terms of what we'll be able to do. So yeah, that's what makes me optimistic. Uh, Brendan, you are brilliant. And, you know, just uh, for those who, who are not on social media, we shared quotes from each of the speakers today on LinkedIn and if you could see the love and the admiration for each of these speakers, um, you would just be astonished, just the, the passion that each of them exhibits. But um, Barton, the uh, former head of McKinsey, once said to me, every great leader he's ever met is infectiously optimistic, but it's not the big man or woman at the stage, it's the person who can unlock the optimism in the team. And each of these young leaders is doing that. Brendan, you've already half introduced Donald. <laughs> and so Donald is the business support officer at Goulburn Murray Water. And, and his conversations every day with people um, lift them up for them to live a better life. So Brendan, do you want to ask Donald what makes him optimistic? Absolutely. Donald, how are you, mate? Good to see you again. Thanks. Tell us, what makes you optimistic? Great question, Brendan. Thank you for um, answering, uh, answer, asking me this question. So what makes me optimistic is optimism is very exciting for me. Uh, it's something I take great pride in, something I'm very passionate and excited about. And it is the opportunities that present us all every, each and every day and also the choices we make. So the choices we make also create opportunities may create opportunities for other people, may um, create further opportunities for ourselves. Those opportunities and choices may, may not, um, you know, come have the um, expected outcomes that you may always, always wish for, but also if they don't have those um, suspected outcomes that you, you would hope for, that they're going to have outcomes that will allow you to be optimistic and learn from that, that experience and, and, and improve on or adapt, um, change or anything like that. So as Victor said, and also Brendan has alluded to earlier as well. So I'm a business support officer at Goldman Murray Water and I'm also the chair of Water Able. So Water Able is a group of uh, 
representatives across all water all, all, all water corporations in Victoria. And we're, we are a network to embrace uh, disability inclusion. So I myself, a, 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 a total wheelchair bound person, and it gives me great pleasure to lead a, new, a network of people and watch each and every water corporation embrace disability inclusion in learning um, what that involves and also embedding it within their organisations. One, one key element for me, and that only was this week, is I um, had a conversation with a water corporation and then through that conversation, that they were saying that they, they wanted to learn more about disability inclusion. They have the framework in place but they potentially don't have the the structure or want to want to learn how to to structure or structure it more effectively for their organisation and what outcomes they wish to achieve. So that gave me the opportunity to actually pair them with Goulburn Murray Water, and to watch both organisations already within the last few days come together and collaborate for disability inclusion, to me, is very, very successful, um, very heartwarming for myself. Disability inclusion is something that I'm very passionate about. And the reason I'm so passionate about disability inclusion is because I, I want to watch people thrive. I don't want to see people, um, you know, look at things and say, I can't do that. The thing is, yes, you can. Yes, you may need to do differently, but there is supports out there. Let's embrace that and let's build, build on disability inclusion, but also let's em embrace and build on the entire Victorian water sector and contribute to uh, our country and also contribute to our customers and let's just make this world a better place. Thank you. Oh, what an ethos. Isn't that fantastic? And it's not just, you know, inclusion. It's actually people thriving. You know, that's the key. And Martin Seligman, you know, the great guru of positive psychology, you know, wrote the book Thrive. So I think you've nailed that. Look, running a long time. Now, Harriet's been very generous and she said she's going to join our breakout groups. So everyone who's not on video, please switch on your videos now and switch on your audio. We're going to break up into nine rooms of about five or six people for six minutes. And I'd like you to share what makes you optimistic and how you kept your team optimistic. We then had breakout groups for six minutes and the video resumes on return. Hi, Hi everyone. Welcome back. We, Di and I were just saying six minutes is too short and 10 minutes is too long, but did everyone have a great time? Donald, do you want to share first? And So certainly. So within my breakout room, there was great discussion around um, what, what we do daily, um, in our daily lives, in our personal lives, um, how we move around with uh, keeping our optimism in the COVID situation and just all things like that. So I found it really inspiring um, how everyone is tackling optimism differently. Not everyone's the same, which is great, but we also how we're, how we're acknowledging that. Absolutely brilliant. Now, Pete Morrison, I know I did a long interview with you. So as the head of Vic Water, just, just reflect on your optimism, the optimism for the sector. Well, one of the things we spoke about, Victor, in our six minutes, and they were very efficient, by the way, is, uh, is the circular economy. I think that's a great thing to talk about as a sector. We are awesome at the circular economy, and we could do so much more about promoting what we do in the circular economy. I think that we're central to it and that this industry, because it just gets on and does stuff, is at the wedge of actually showing the whole state and the nation how good we are with this. 
there's so many projects out there and because of the the stem and the brilliance of our people uh, we can just do great things and i look forward to seeing more of that thanks victor you are you are a great leader in optimism i just um if anyone ever wants to have a look at a good one hour philosophical view of optimism peter peter absolutely nails it gay um could chris uh, repeat his little quote about winter and spring i thought that was lovely please Oh, Chris, would you mind that that beautiful expression of, of light and shade? Oh, yep, yeah, sure. Um, I guess it's one thing that we have to remind ourselves is there's always a light at the end of the tunnel. And my quote was, would spring be so as so sweet if there was no winter? And it's just to enjoy the things we can go out and do again once COVID restrictions ease. I know some things I normally wouldn't like that much, such as the commute. It's now pretty high on my list of, wouldn't it be nice to fight for a seat on the train again? Yeah. yeah thank you. Thank you, Chris and um, Victor, for that. That's, I love that little quote. Would and, be, and Gay would is a so recruiter sweet. for Rotary for public speakers. So, Chris, I think, I think you can expect an invitation for some Rotary speeches now. Now, Nicola, you're applauding. <laughs> Do you want to share something? No. Yes? No? No. <laughs> I'm not sure which one I was applauding. I thought it was a great quote and I thought it was a great, you've just been, um, yeah, you've just been targeted to give another speech somewhere else. So I'm just laughing. Thank you for that. <laughs> well, each of the speakers is just so inspiring. And, you know, the Parliamentary Secretary has been so generous in staying on to listen. Dean, do you want to share what makes you optimistic? Yeah, well, I feel I'm a little bit of an intruder in the sense that um, I'm outside the water sector, but I guess providing best available technology in the gasification and pyrolysis space to the water sector. So getting to know a lot of you um, week by week. And um, I guess what keeps me really optimistic is the, is the level of um, innovation um in the water sector that you know obviously water is a very very basic human right um but it's not stayed it's not boring yes there's been dams and you know infrastructure around for a hundred and something years but but um things are always growing and there's always new projects and so that's what keeps me excited and and optimistic about the future of i guess the sector but also looking at I was talking in our group about, you know, the whole idea of the circular economy and turning what was a, a waste stream, biosolids and other things, FOGO and other things into resource, right? That can be valuable to lots of people. So that, that's what keeps me energized, Victor. No, and you're, you're very passionate. You live on at Warrandyte near the river, so you know what we're doing in regenerative. Brendan, just do you want to just share? I think you can share a little bit about that plan. You've got recycled water, you've got waste to energy, but now you've got this genius idea of clean green hydrogen. So I know Tiff's on the call as well. Do you two want to share what you're going to do in green hydrogen? Because you everyone else is talking about it. You guys are doing it. More than happy for Tiff to take the lead on that one. I think that's uh, not, not something I've been. Uh, super involved in so Tiff, if you if you know a little bit more, I know we're doing. I think it's great, but uh, I'll leave it to someone that knows a bit more. I'll give it a go because it's it's there's a lot of highly technical stuff in the hydrogen space, obviously. But the the principle is that um, you can you can use the um, the you know the processes in the water industry to to you know create hydrogen as a as a useful byproduct instead of sort of wasting things. So it's very circular, um, and I think it's. It's also, um, it's very circular and it's obviously an innovative and progressive um, fuel of the future that, that, you know, governments are looking at. So we're, we're, I guess in our context, it all started with um, an exploration with Jacobs actually about, well, how could that apply, you know, on one of our sites and how could we look at what we do, um, the production methods, et cetera, to, you know, to actually end up with hydrogen, you know, as a fuel. And I think the other thing is, um, to do it in a cost-effective way, because one of the big barriers for hydrogen has always been the, the price and how, how do you bring that down? So um, we think the water industry is really well-placed um, 
to be able to do that and get into that space. So I guess I won't flip out all our secrets at this point, but we're, we're certainly moving along with, um, with looking at how we can actually make this happen and, um, you know, what market is available there. And I think, you know, the other aspect of that is, um, you know, here in Victoria, you know, embracing emerging technology and Victorian technology to actually make this happen. So it's very exciting, very circular. Um, watch this space. <laughs> but um, that's probably in a nutshell. Yeah. Beautifully summarised. Georgie, Georgie, you come at this from two spaces. So you're both um, young leaders, but you're also at Jacobs. So what are the really exciting innovations that you're seeing? I think there's a, a lot going on, even uh, the work with circular economy at Gera. So working with um, the waste to energy plant at Aurora um, and extending uh, waste to energy to, to different types of um, inputs, like for example, food waste. Uh, I think that's really exciting. It's very um, exciting. On the way to Z carbon neutral, five years ahead of government mandate, Harriet, that's that's where, where we're headed at the moment. So it's pretty exciting. So look, Gary Miller just wants to do a shout out to Southeast Water on an IoT project that demonstrated gumption to innovate. Um, Yarra Valley Water, we talk about a brave culture. I love that gumption to innovate. So look, we reached the sort of 52 minute mark. So Gary, do you just want to do that shout out to Southeast? Then I want to throw to you, Harriet, if that's all right, to, to summarize where we've got to today and to, to thank our young leaders. Um, and then Amanda, it's over to you and Kay to lead us out. So Gary, do you just want to do that shout out to Southeast and say, what is gumption to innovate? You know, thank you. I mean, it takes a lot of gumption, I believe, to innovate. Um, I was working for Wipro Digital and we were invited to um, deliver an IoT, an Internet of Things project for them. It was the first of its kind. Um, worked with Peter O'Donoghue, um, if you know Pod, um, I'm sure people will be nodding. Um, and it was an operations led project. Um, it was looking at a pilot of 2000 sensors and meters and there was a telcos, the telco partnership and a whole range of other things. But um, the point is that um, it hadn't been done before. It had been done in various prototype forms globally. Um, and the, the only way it was really only the only way it was only ever going to get off the ground was if someone, you know, grasped ho hold of it and, you know, had a go. So um, I was delighted to work over in um, in Frankston. The offices are beautiful and the furniture, uh, they're not replicas, they're the real thing. You know, I mean, really, there's some there's some class there, a beautiful office. But, um, you know, the business was um, very engaged. Um, there were times when we drifted off, not quite knowing sort of, um, you know, what path we were on because it was an un untrodden path. Um, but, um, you know, I, I take my hat off to the business um, and for those that worked with us, um, even those that clearly their jobs were in jeopardy and, you know, jobs aren't always in jeopardy with technology, often they're enhanced. But um, there was a very good culture where people recognize that, that there would still be a role for themselves. So, you know, a big call out for Southeast Water for having the gumption uh, to innovate and to show the way. Well, Gary, that's everyone put that down in your phrase book. I'm gonna put that down in mine, gumption to innovate. I think that is fantastic. Look, um, as these things all, the hour always rushes by. So Harriet, could I ask you to, to share what you've learned today and to, to thank our young leaders. And then I'll call Amanda to thank you and to take us out with Kay and with Sol. Thank you so much, Victor. Thank you everybody for the most invigorating conversation I've had in some time. Uh, it is so fortifying to see the work that is going on across the board uh, to evolve, to innovate, to problem solve, to collaborate, and again, to, to act, to pick up on the new touch word of the day with gumption uh, and to be resilient uh, in the face of all of the changes and the challenges that we have. Um, I want to thank everyone who works so hard 
and so collaboratively to make such positive change a reality. Across the board, we are seeing environments change, we're seeing availability and supply be enhanced, we're seeing efficiencies grow, uh, and we're seeing results that are making a world of difference. Uh, these are changes which will, um, despite the fact that your name may not be known for them, uh, will last and endure for generations. So thank you for all of the things that you do and the values that you live in all that you contribute. Um, you do this without expectation of recognition or reward, but I think it's really important to recognise uh, all that you do. And, and I hope that you feel uh, supported in the work that you do and the diversity that you are bringing and these rich experiences that are shaping a much better collective product than, than we would ever be able to come up with as individuals. Um, I was going to make a practical suggestion, Victor, if there is somebody who knows how to actually take a screenshot shot of participants here and we wanted to do a group photo I would love oh Dean you put your hand up that's fantastic you're you're up um, I would love if people um, who wanted to be part of a group photo uh, would be able to turn on cameras and join us because um, I'd love to pump up your tires a bit on social media and to thank you for all that you're doing more broadly if that's possible but thank you so much for having me it's been such a delight. Amanda I throw to you. Thanks, Victor. So thank you so much, um, Harriet, for joining us today, and also to all of the to all of the um, young leaders that um, I've had the pleasure of getting to know in the last um, twelve months: Donald, Brendan, Georgina, and Chris. Um, and yeah, it was just a fantastic event, and exactly what I needed on a Friday to pump up my optimism before we went into the weekend. So. Um, I'm going to start playing the song. When you're down and troubled and you need nothing, nothing. Nothing, it's going right. right. Well, we hope you enjoyed that hour of optimism. We concluded with singing You've Got a Friend and uh, a wonderful, wonderful, friendly event. So, look, we'd love you to be involved with the Centre for Optimism. You can see the website on the screen, centreforoptimism.com. Our partners, Vic Water and the Australian Water Association, wonderful organisations for leadership in the water sector uh, and to the Parliamentary Secretary and the Department of Environment uh, for their support and assistance in this program. Have a great day and lead with optimism. <laughs>